Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. So me and Maria Clara, we co-founded uh, together the project uh, called This Is Not The Truth. It's um, a project based on a YouTube channel. Mainly we created content. We did a web series. I think some of you uh, watched it, a documentary series called what, what Is Emerging. And we released that a year ago. And apart from that series, we've been doing um, some other interviews that are on the web channel and we have a channel on Instagram as well. The idea with this project, This Is Not The Truth, is to investigate emerging narratives for paradigm shift. So we were on a quest when we first met at Schumacher College in the UK, apart from the fact that we are Brazilian, we are not from the same city in Brazil. So we met when we were in England and we started this project a couple of years ago and that has been one of our main occupations until now. But tonight we were here actually to talk about other projects that I, that I take part. It's the collective gesturing towards the colonial futures that it's called GTDF Collective. I'll put the link here afterwards. And this is also related to the research that I do together with Maria Clara, but it's not always uh, translated into like video content as we do with This Is Not The Truth. It's usually more research in the field. We work a lot with indigenous people and mainly we work with pedagogical experiments on how we can move out of the frames of modernity that we are sort of stuck in. So that's a brief introduction. Maria, let's see if we can hear you. Sorry, everyone, is that I'm in the countryside, so the internet is totally weird. So sorry for that. Uh, I see that Camille already uh, talked briefly about the gesturing towards the Colonial Future Collective. So my question would be, what is gesturing towards the Colonial Futures Collective? So yeah, I was just talking like the structure of the collective. I'll tell a little bit about the, um, the story, right? It's actually really connected to Canada because it was started by a professor that is now, that has been teaching in UBC in Vancouver for quite a while now. And this teacher is Vanessa Andreotti and she's Brazilian, but she has been living in Canada for a while. And she has a chair in race, inequality and global education at UBC. So she started, since she started the gesturing towards the colonial futures as a space where we could do experimental pedagogical research on how we could move away from the colonial forms of being and living that we are usually trapped in. And every time we try to do something different, we try to like fix something or go more sustainable or be more just or inclusive and things like that, that I'm sure quite a few here are familiar with those movements. A lot of times we feel ourselves trapped in the same kind of paradigm and repeating the same kind of mistakes, even though we have a different intention. So, so we've been doing pedagogical experiments. The collective exists for five years, more or less. I've joined for uh, two years now. So it's, there's this connection directly to Canada because of Professor Vanessa Andreotti and also with some of the indigenous nations in Canada that she works more directly. And as I'm based in Brazil, I work with the international researchers and with the indigenous researchers uh, from Brazil and Latin America. So Brazil, Peru, and Mexico. Yeah, that's a brief introduction about Ooh. the collection. So, yeah, I, I wonder um, about what the time time of the, the frame of the coloniality you engage in the collective because in Latin America we have a lot of uh, thinkers like Lelia Gonzalez that engages like a black feminist theorist in the the colonial movement we have also Julieta Paredes who has a more uh, uh, intention connected to the indigenous communities also some of them that talk a lot of about ecofeminism connected to the, col the coloniality. So 
what is the main uh, approach to the coloniality in the collective? Yes, this word is quite uh, used nowadays, I guess, also in Canada. So the colonial studies is sort of everywhere and applied to all sorts of areas. And the specific way that we see uh, the coloniality from the point of view of the GTDF collective experiences, experiments is that we see coloniality starting when we first started to get separated from the land. So the separation between humans and the land that we step on, that we live in, so the earth as not only like the earth as a system, but the earth as the, the land itself where we step. When we started to detach ourselves from that, we see that process as a start of a colonial process. We started colonizing the land and from colonizing the land, we started colonizing one another and other human beings and then all the violence and systemic uh, and historical violence that we see perpetuated. So I think that's a core uh, point of view. We don't see coloniality starting when European people came to the Americas, right? It was long before that. Of course, that had a huge impact as well, but it's not the case to address that specifically. And the other thing that I think is, is very uh, core vision of the collective is also that we, we, don't see, we don't see a separation between the unsustainable ways that we live in the earth. So we know that we've been living in modern ways that are not sustainable for the planet that we have. So if we keep going in this direction, it's going to end soon, like resources are not enough. And this is deeply, deeply connected to the historical and systemic violence that we see with different people and not only like indigenous nations, but also with people that are always um, on the bottom of the system or something like that, like in the south of the south. And so we don't see that separate. We always analyze and we always do practices and we always try to understand the connection between the, our insustainable ways, ways of living and the systemic violence. We don't, we don't, we do not sort of allow in our minds the separation. Um, because of what I was talking in the beginning, usually when we do the, the separation, we are being violent again, either with the earth or with some, some population. So we try to put that together always in a critical way. I wonder if, if you could talk um, a little bit more about the methods that you guys use to engage because it's it's like we are trapped so how do uh, see outside this frame that it's kind of immersed in every little thing we we are so maybe the social cartographies and the house of modernity that is the one i'm most familiar with it's a very good thing to talk about yeah so we've been working with educational experiments so both like courses like formal courses in universities for example Vanessa this teacher that is connected to UBC there's another teacher in Durham in England also so a little bit of exper experiments happens inside the university but most of it happens outside of university in an informal way so before this situation that we are living in 2020 we used to have like uh, immersion courses, so sort of like retreats where we would go for a week and have these layers of, of learning together and of uh, experimenting uh, together in place, right? So the best way would be to, for people to go on a workshop that they are immersed in a lot of time. And this there was a base for these experiments to happen that was in Slovenia, in, in Slovenia, in Eastern Europe. And we used to go there like every, every summer for four years. The collective has been doing work there with a lot of people that are activists or working with education or philosophy or towards other ways of thinking and being in the world, right? Uh, now we are trying more and more online versions. So we are having online courses and study groups as well and trying to bring this experience that was super based on the present to an online uh, way 
And apart from Slovenia, me and Gino, my partner, we have started here in Brazil a project called Terra Dentro, where we work here a lot with Brazilian people, both indigenous and non-indigenous, trying to understand where, when is it that is uh, suitable for us to be working together and when is it that, that we are doing like some work with white people uh, mainly because it's a very different work to be done. So yeah, in these pedagogical experiments, either offline or online now, we work a lot with social cartographies. Uh, I don't know if everyone is familiar with, but one easy way to, to explain is to compare it with theories. Theories are more like a fixed way of knowing that you got to that theory and then you are going to work from that. Social cartographies are just like coming to a very simple point would be like drawings of a system that we understand and then we can open a conversation from that social cartography. So social cartography is easier and playful and it just moves the knowledge. It doesn't fix the knowledge. So we understand knowledge as something that, is, that should move us towards something. And then we talk a lot also uh, about what is the direction that we want to move, right? With this uh, knowledge that is not fixed. So where are we going? So instead of moving forward, forward, like to the front, as modernity usually <laughs> brings us to think that is the best way, right? Let's go forward, let's go further. We try to take take things deeper. So we try to, to understand the relation with direction in a different way. And by breaking that in our minds, by understanding that it's not moving forward, it's not a resolution, it's not solution oriented, it's not a final answer, it's not only one truth and all of that, that is really a base of the modernity. Uh, we try to go deeper and to understand what are the spirals that can bring us deeper. So work is done with a lot of discussion. Of course, we put out social cartographies, for example, House of Modernity, and then we can have a talk. Also, actually, if we have the time, this is, this is one of the cartographies we would like to, to share a little bit with you. And also, we work with other ways of exercising our body in the space and to relate our bodies to nature, to understand ourselves more connected to the whole metabolism that we are inserted in so to bring back those connections that we have in ourselves and that we are connected to a larger systems but a lot of times we're not used to read that so we don't have the language to have this this relation anymore we don't have the language that intermediates these relations so we try to playfully with art sometimes sometimes with indigenous practices sometimes um, yeah just experimenting with the earth to try to get those connections back. Maybe uh, you could share a little bit more about the House of Modernity because I really think it's, it's good. Maybe, I, I don't know if you guys uh, are familiar with the, this frame because it, for me, uh, it really gives a, a, a view that is different and the sensing of the what you're talking about so maybe what do you guys think to to share about the house of modernity cool <laughs> not cool let me see if i find a quick link here so everyone can just um maybe open to to see the drawing just a second um maybe gino can you help me i'm asking someone that is here okay i will yeah. start talking and then if if i find the link i will put it out on the chat but the house of modernity the idea is to understand that we have a modernity has built one big big house on the top of the earth. So we live in this big house that the earth cannot sustain anymore. So what we try to do usually is to include people inside the house. So we're like, oh, here in this house of modernity is so comfortable. We have everything, we have access, we have technology, we have like health and research and we have what we need and we use the resources. But the problem is that not everyone fits sort of on the house. I think Gino sent the 
the link there. So if people want to, to have a look at the house or should I share here on the screen? Yeah, I can give you, um, I can share on my okay. screen or I can give you co-host okay. access to share. Yeah, Maybe if you, if you want to share, it's yeah. just this, this the oh, figure sure. on this link here. Thank you. Well, anyway, so the house that modernity built, thank you, perfect. The idea is, so this, this house is very big for the planet, right? There are hidden costs on it, so, so the, the relations between on how this house works, there are costs that are not usually um, seen by everyone. So both like waste disposal and pollution and this kind of thing, but also expropriation and violence and systemic, systemic violence that are perpetuated for us in a way to live in this comfort zone that we live. If we are here sitting in front of each other on the internet, we are already <laughs> in some kind of uh, better place of this house, right? A lot of people cannot be here. Uh, and then one, one of the, the drawings that I think is very interesting, it's the third one on the first lane. Um, that is talking about the, fo the false idea, the false promise of social mobility, of a universal middle class. So we think we are like, we are made or we are taught to, to understand that if we deserve, if we do well in our lives and if we can, if we do hard work, we're going to climb up those stairs, right? We are going to be in a better place than other generations were. So it sort of depends on the individual to make its path towards success or something. It depends on your autonomy or your ambition and things like that. So we are led to think that there is this possibility of social mobility for everyone. And indeed, there are stairs inside the house. We can see that happening. We can prove that. But the thing is that not everyone fits in the house. So a lot of people, the system is designed for a lot of people to be on the bottom. There's no way that everyone would go to the top of the house or to the top of the economic system. And because the ceiling has a limit, as you see there, not everyone fits there. The system doesn't work if everyone is in the, system, is in the ceiling. And we have to remember also that there's always a lot of people outside of the house. So when we think of modernity as a way of living, and modern habits and modern access to food, medicines, uh, and other things that are beneficial, not everyone is living this. So we sort of live in this trans historical moment where history is not aligned for everyone. So this already breaks the, <laughs> the view of, of modernity itself that thinks that usually see things as linear, right? And things as a, a, common, a common thread that unite us all and the thing is that time doesn't work in this linear way there are a lot of people living still nowadays as they used to live a long time ago and also that's where we get a lot of uh, learnings and teachings from and still in this third house um, there's this division between north and south that is related to the global north and global south of course there's it's not a coincidence that usually it's, it's connected to the geographical division of north and south. Uh, north of the planet is uh, a lot more rich than the south of the planet. But here we bring in uh, another ingredient that is saying that in the north, there's the south of the north. So there are in the north of the planet people that are excluded and that are not uh, gaining these benefits of the modern way of living, right? So the people that are being systematically violated and exterminated and still dying for the la their lands and things like that, we know that this exists also on the North. And also on the other hand, the truth also applies. There's the South, there's the North of the South. So even in the geographical South, there's a lot of, the, a lot of rich uh, rich people and like a lot of very privileged classes and groups of people that are living mostly like most of the people in the north. So that's not a linear relation, but it's important to understand that. And most importantly, to understand that there will always be people outside of this house. 
So inclusion and just trying to repair damage that have been done historically, usually we, what we are seeing is, is that this doesn't work. So we see a structure, structural damage happening in this house. So the walls are all broken. So we see economical crisis, we see climate crisis, we see people moving for being forced to move from one place to the other. So conflicts and uh, forced migration and all of that. That's a big, big damage in this house that modernity build, build. And then we are set with the question, like, what should we do then? Are we going to fix all these walls? Are we going to try to expand the house even more? But then the planet doesn't, doesn't fit this house. Or should we build other types of house? How else can we live? What's the other ways of living? And that's where we come. And that's usually where we start and to get deep in our courses and our workshops. So what are the other ways of living and being that we can try to move towards because we are super limited by the ways of thinking of modernity. So every time that we are thinking that we are outside of the box, we are probably just in another box, right? We go to this other box and then we're, oh, now I'm outside of the box. Now I'm thinking a very different thing. But the consciousness that we try to bring here is that we are super trapped like deeply um, in neurolog bioneurologically even uh, attached to the strings of modernity. So what are the ways that we can do some movements towards other futures? And that's why also the name of the collective, it's not that we are gonna get there. We're not gonna be in a decolonial future in a couple of years or in a generation. It's an intergenerational work. It's a work that it should start and at some point it will get somewhere. We are not sure where is it, where is it, but we are sure that we cannot be like stuck in the situation that we are now that is not working for most of the people and not working for the planet either. Yeah, there was a brief thing of the modern house. Cool. So there are already some uh, uh, question here, um, but maybe I can make a, a small question that it, before the the question and answer part. That is together with this the practices of the social cartographies. You have a lot of artistic experiments that you engage in in the collective. So uh, recently, I engaged with one created by Dani Di Emilia, who is one of the researchers in the collective, who was about, the name was Deface Yourself, where we, we had like our photos, our pictures, and we had to make um, a cut in our face, and we have to spend a week taking photos of other things in our face. So it was a kind of art therapy experiment that for me personally, it was a very, interesting experiment and it's it's for me it was very interesting how in in this deface experiment we start engaging in like uh, liking the ways we are putting we we engage in other kinds of um like other boxes that is to be liking the photos you take with the experiment so you know it's for me similar to what you were talking about when we are trying to to even create these exercises, we are so trapped in the frames of modernity that we want to, you know, post the, the, the photo that we create. So there are a lot of, you know, layers of these traps. So my question is about uh, what are the other experiments and how is the, this uh, relation with these artistic experiments? And actually, like, I know that you has been working with art and with museums and um, in for many years in your life. So what is also your perspective in the um, like art, you know, what we call art in this decolonial movement and, and also in the artistic experiments in the collective? Yes, thank you. Yeah, in the, in the, together with the collective, we have a lot of artists working with us and I'm very glad for that because I'm not one of them <laughs> and and I, we learn a lot from what they can bring so I've always believed in art as a way of 
changing the word, for instance, like in less sense, but mainly for like taking us out of out of the zone that we are usually comfortable in. So out of our current most common kind of thought. So yeah, I've been working with museums and education in museums and understanding how art can play a role in the shift of paradigm. And I'm more and more convinced that big institutions are not the way for, to do that, though I'm still related to some work in museums, which I love, but I don't think they can, as a big institution, make deep changes. So they can like scale things up, but they don't go very deep. So I'm much more interested now in these pedagogical experiments that are connected also in using artistic experiments inside these practices, even though sometimes it's for a group of 10 people or 24 people and stuff like that. It's in a much, much smaller scale because it has to be experimental and you have to put your body there. And even if it's online, it, it demands a lot of like energy coming together. But yeah, I, I think it makes more sense now not to, to scale it up. And with artistic experiments, what I think the one that Maria mentioned uh, from the artist uh, Dani Demilia, for example, they help us move out of our traditional way of seeing ourselves and seeing ourselves as a coherent self, as one self that we have to defend and that we have to be, or for example, right, uh, try to be more um, to understand. Uh, I was also trying to relate with the question here because usually we see ourselves as very dual as well. Like either we are doing something good or we are doing something bad. Are we in the right path or are we still in the wrong path and this kind of thing. So the exercises with art help me personally in my journey in the collective as a, learn, as a, as a learning experience also for me to detach myself from this fixed self. And defixating myself help me, helps me understand how I can understand knowledge as a moving thing, not as a fixed thing. And then maybe I'm playing with the lines that are limiting us uh, with modernity. Um, I've been, let me just say something, because we've been talking about like some critics, some strong criticism about modernity, right? And I just like to, to make sure we are sort of on the same page. We understand that modernity has a lot of beneficial things that it brought to us and we don't want to neglect that and go back old ways to some kind of previous ways of living and relating. So it's not about that. It's about recognizing everything that modernity has brought to us and understanding also how it has been limiting ourselves to expand to um, a better and a more possible way of living futures. So acknowledging the contradictions in that and <laughs> embracing uh, what we can that is, that is good into a certain kind of limit. And usually the limit would be what is good and does not affect violently and systemically. Uh, some other people or the earth. Cool. So maybe we can move to the questions. We have already three super interesting questions. One that you already started uh, responding somehow. So Rain, should, did, they meant, did I said right? Do you want to talk? Yeah, thanks. Um, Thanks so much for being here. And uh, I really liked the thing about social cartographies um, and like <clears throat> knowledge that moves um, instead of being fixed. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna shift my question slightly because you kind of answered that dualism. Um, we, we deal with the culture war a lot on the STOA. So I wanna ask, how do you differentiate yourself from some of the social justice work that has become kind of dumb, dumbed down, um, like very ideological and dogmatic and sort of like taking these really important values and uh, alienating a lot of people because of the kind of simplicity of their arguments and lack of ability to engage in discourse. 
how do you differentiate yourself from those um, those kind of unsophisticated uh, types of activism? Yes, very, very good question and reflection for us to do together. Because a lot of times what happens is that we try to explain what we are doing. And a lot of people say, wow, I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> and my project is this one. And we're like, that's really in a different direction, right? <laughs> so one way that we've been trying to, to not to differentiate ourselves, but to, to help everyone to have their own sort of tools to understand differences between directions. So we put, we, we sort of like set things in a system that is through directions and not through fixed like tags. This, this project is this and these people are doing that. So it's not fixed tags, it's more like, where are they moving towards? So apart from the word that they are using, that sometimes is the same word that I'm using and someone in the academy is using, what is the direction that this is moving? So we are trying to develop a work that, are called, that is called the Raiders. Uh, so we have now about like 12 Raiders uh, that we are working on. And we always work this on in courses and with other people so we can always enrich and make this process better. It's still not very around work, but the idea is that everyone should have the tools of Raiders to understand what is the direction that things are going? So am I moving, am I moving deep? Am, am I going deeper in this question? Or am I just trying to get to a solution? This is like one, one of the main kinds of raiders. Am I moving forward? Am I getting just big and going to a resolution, to a final answer? Or am I moving towards something that is unknown, that is dark, that is like with know that I have no knowledge exactly about it but I feel and sense that the direction is deeper and one other thing very important on how we understand direction is that we are centering we try to or we wonder we understand that is better to center the earth so what is the center of this direction is this defending one group of people is this defending the woman is this defending uh, these people here that, is, uh, that are trapped and that need their land back, or is this defending the earth as a bigger metabolism that encompasses the woman and this group of people and stuff like that. So we try to, to move towards the centering of the earth as opposed to being in one single fight with one single sort of discourse. I do understand the, the importance of single fights a lot of times you have you are on the front line you are trying to stop something to happen and you are doing one single fight and i do respect that it's just not the space that i work on maybe camila this is also connected to the alta intensidade how do you say that in english maybe this is also something interesting to talk about yeah, to, of the high intensity and low intensity struggle. It's, a, it's an important um, cartography also that we work with is to differentiate um, who is in a high intensity struggle than people that are in a low intensity struggle. So this is always one, one first thing before evaluating uh, like a project or trying to analyze what other people are doing. We try to understand if they are in a struggle that their lives depend on. So people that needs to fight every day to breathe, just to have the right of living, just to be in the land that they are. And I know Canada, Canada has a, a big conflict and history also and present with a lot of indigenous people there. So maybe from that sense, you can, you can relate to what I'm saying. And the difference between those and people that are in a low intensity struggle, like I struggle with being in this world that is so full of problems and I'm trying to do my work here and all of that, but I don't, I'm not obliged to every day wake up and fight. If I, if I 
if I decide to go and work as a waitress for a year, I have this option. So if you have an option, you are in a low intensity struggle fight. And that's a very, very different place than who doesn't have this option. Uh, both because their heart is in, in a place that they cannot move out from that. But usually I'm talking more objectively about people that don't have this option because their life are at risk at all times. So that's also a way of uh, sort of calibrating our radars when we see other work happening. Um, there is also Dan that uh, made some questions. And so maybe you wanna speak? Yes, I wanna hear you more people. Yeah, let me see if I can find my question here. Um, uh, yes, you mentioned earlier, Camille, that um, that as big institutions can scale, as you recognize that big institutions can scale, but they may not necessarily change very effectively. Has the collective explored how to create and build new institutions from scratch? If so, what has been your experience? Thanks. Mm, yeah. No, we haven't, we haven't worked with creating institutions. We are still trying to work on like margins and very uh, small scale projects. Some of us like individually go back to institutions and sort of feedback that into the work that they do in institutions. Um, there's this, this teacher, for example, this professor in the UK, Sarah, she tries to do her work, like to connect the work from GTDF back to the university. And it's usually a lot of frustration. So yeah, starting a, <laughs> an institution from the scratch could be a way to do it differently. I don't know. Thank you. And there is also your other question then about like the vector uh, vectors in the the radars, I think. But I maybe Camila had already replied because when you were talking about the radars, I think you you said that right. Yeah, I think I think she sort of it was more of a comment. I, you were talking about that when you were, um, I guess, when you're coming to get. This is my understanding. Correct me if I'm wrong. When you come together and you have a conversation, it's not so much about what's the vision and where do you want to end up? But it's, I feel that I wanna go in this direction. And I was just commenting that directions have um, uh, like a vector, it has a direction, but it also has a magnitude. Like maybe I just wanna take one small step in that direction as opposed to, I wanna run a, ma a marathon in that direction. And that was. Yeah, yeah. totally. I like, like that. And it relates to what I was saying, thank you. Yeah, I think it's very connected to what you always say, Camila, of going too deep in the earth, like in the soil, metaphorically, like a, a mycelium or like and not forward. And there's another uh, question of uh, Yosu. Maybe you want to uh, join and say it? Or... Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> um, oh, can you hear me? My mic. Hi. Can you can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, I had a couple questions, but then I just wanted to clarify something first. You mentioned, uh, well, it's just in my own words. You mentioned so the degree to a uh, degree to which a demographic or a population is connected to the land. I think you initially said is like correlated to the potential for um, um, the, uh, the colonial mindset? Is that, is that what one of the sort of outcomes or findings that you've Yeah, seen? there was oh, that, I can yeah. clarify later. But. So is there, is there anything that you're exploring in the digital realm and now, especially with the way that we're necessarily detached from land? And is there, um, like it seems to me like there's what you're referring to by the land is also like there's like a, there's an inequality 
to the access to various economic resources that various populations can have. So, um, but, and then, you know, now that we're in this sort of data driven age and there's, you know, we're in these virtual classrooms and with everything with COVID going on, is there anything that you're specifically experimenting with um, in, in the virtual digital realm? Hmm. I think nothing, nothing major or nothing very like mind blowing that we are experiencing in the digital realm. And I also understand that this is happening because we are not very well connected to people that are doing um, like edge work on that, like people that are being most innovative on that, on those areas. We are, we are, as a collective are not connected to these people yet. So we are sort of doing the usual on the digital. What has been happening different for, for us is that there was a lot of travel involved with a lot of people from the collective. So a lot of times like someone was away for a month and someone was with an indigenous uh, uh, group researching for two months. And the moments where we were together were very little and very precious throughout the year. And now that everyone is back in their homes, uh, we, we, we are going much deeper in developing our own research. So we are testing the pedagogical experiences with uh, much faster because we have like people available and people available everywhere. So the availability changed a lot, but not, I wouldn't say we, we, are, we are moving uh, somewhere very different using digital i would love to to do that more and yeah i think that's it thank you there is one question of peter okay you want to join yes um so something that you said that caught my attention was uh kind of the how art is a spiritual opportunity and how kind of this collective is, is utilizing art to kind of make us aware of the being in the house of modernity and, and figuring out ways to go beyond it. And I'm curious if you are integrating any conversational like modalities, authentic relating modalities and Dominic Barter's coming to mind with restorative circles. I know he's from Brazil as well. Um, Cause one of the things that we talk here at the Stoa is like trauma, accumulated trauma or being in the trauma scene and how that kind of prevents people from deeply connecting and being in right relationship. And if you can't be in right relationship with another person, then it's going to be hard to be in right relationship with, you know, the planet and everything else that's uh, deeply important. Um, so I wondered if there's, cause I personally think there's a great opportunity to, to have art and spiritual conversations emerge. So I'm wondering if the collective is thinking anything with that along those lines. Yeah. Thank you. One of the sort of mottos that we were working last year was having different, uh, having difficult conversations without relationships falling apart. So being able to say what needs to be said and without sort of taking it personal. And so without making it a fight. And in that sense, I would risk saying it sort of inspired a little bit in Dominic's work with nonviolent communication and all of that. I'm very familiar uh, with his work, but no, we don't use like specific uh, methodologies or restorative circles uh, to do that. Because also I think that we, we are addressing a lot the limitations of the conversation. So at the same time that we think difficult conversations has to happen without the relationships falling apart, we understand the limits of the word and of language. And this limitation is pointed back to us very, very directly when we are working with indigenous people. And it's not something we can neglect. We're like, okay, we cannot, we cannot say everything. We cannot put everything on the paper. We cannot even draw everything. There are a lot of things that are beyond. So there is a certain movement connected to art and indigenous knowledge that is saying it's not always through dialogue, through dialogue. So um, there are these two, two forces 
at the same time in the work that we've been doing. So understanding limits of the significance and or the, yeah, of the meaning of, the, uh, of how we understand each other in language and how this can be more limitating and suffocating than possible of expanding uh, our limits, something like that. So I see these two forces at the same time. So we try to do some good dialogue, but at the same time, we're not, that's not how we're gonna move. <laughs> Thank you. It reminds me also, Peter, of the, a poem that, uh, that poem from the collective about the violences that are brought sometimes in the dialogues and um, that is written by, I think, uh, a group of indigenous people from Canada that maybe it's, it's very, like, it's something very strongly written. It's, that is, it has a, a feeling connected to it about it that is very good to read. So there is another question here. One is done again, uh, asking how to be engaged in the collective, involved, and um, with another one. So maybe you wanna join? Sure, I seem to, this session seems to be making me very curious with questions here. Um, yeah, I, I guess I was just, I, I'm appreciating your approach and I'm just wondering, you know, I'm asking for myself and, and other attendees here, who may be uh, sharing my um, feelings, is there a way for the public or for people that are you know, in the stoa here to get involved some way uh, with some of these experiments that you're doing? Well, as a collective and very organically led by a lot of people, we don't have very formal ways that people can like enter or join. For example, my, my story with the collective, I went to do a course in Slovenia as a student. And right after the course, I was like, can I stay longer? Can I stay researching with you guys? I have another couple of weeks and and they were like, hey, yeah, but we are on a program connected to UBC Canada. So people are like, sponsor, like they, they were the fellows that were sponsored to be there. And I was like, okay, but I'm here already. So I sort of like joined. And from that point, I started working with them. So there is not an official point of entry. There's a lot of material on the website. And Actually, me and Gino, my partner, we are working in a lot of courses in Portuguese now. So we have a new course starting like in a week. I would love to, to have you with us, but it's going to be in Portuguese. And in September or probably until mid-October at the most, we will be releasing an online course with the participation of Vanessa Andreotti and in English and then open widely. So that's, that's one way of, of getting in touch with our work deeply. But before that, we can, we can chat and understand what is that you do and understand how is it that you could collaborate. So there's a lot of uh, Zoom sessions, a lot of, a lot of meetings, gatherings from the collective. And quite a few times we invite people from outside that are interested to join. We're like, okay, so this session seems to be related to what you do. So maybe you can come as a listener or maybe you can come and, and share with us what you work with. So yeah, I will leave the context and website and things like that. Uh, Dino just sent the, the poem that I mentioned that is, I can't hold space for you anymore. Yeah, thank you Dino. So I think we are getting in the end of the session. So maybe Camila have a final words for us? No, I think I spoke a lot already. Thank you everyone <laughs> for listening. What we usually like more to do is more like to put people in dialogue and to understand how the social cartographies can actually help us having different, different kinds of dialogue. But for this one hour session and for the first time, meeting you, we thought this format would work better just as a sort of introduction to our work. We're gonna put some links 
to my work and to Maria's work here. We're going to share our contacts as well. And just hoping this is a, a, a first and initial stage of our contact. I'd love to know more also about you all. And I'm very, I'm an admirer of the work that Peter do, does with STOA. So it's very nice for us to be here as well. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, uh, Kin. And I also would like to mention that in episode three of our documentary series, Vanessa Andreotti, who is the, the creator of the collective, uh, is one of the characters. And there is also uh, one interview, uh, I think, uh, with, with Vanessa in dialogue with Bio Akomolafi, which is very interesting and related to everything we've talked about. So uh, maybe you guys wanna watch it. We will send you the links here. I think Camilla, yeah, I will send you my link and that's it. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Maria, uh, Camilla. Um, yes, we would love to have you back in the STOA for round two. I know Maria is gonna be hosting, I'm seeing uh, some upcoming sessions, um, hopefully with Bio, we're gonna invite him soon to the STOA. Um, yeah, so if you'd like to support the story, you can go to the Patreon page. And for upcoming events, uh, we have a really exciting one tomorrow. I think it's in the morning. Uh, let's see. No, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, Praxis to Collective Wisdom, Presence, Warm Dad, and Insight with Benita Roy, Nora Bateson, and Rhea Back, uh, the ladies of the STOA. Uh, it's going to be a really exciting session. They don't they just have a spontaneous dialogue with each other. There's like uh, 150 people are so to that. So check that on the website. It should be really, really cool. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Boom.